Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself Jonathan MSP. This is the Ukraine war uh, news update for the 2nd of May 2023. Sorry it's a little bit later today. I went had a very rare trip to the pub with some friends last night and uh, a chap that's not been up with us before is a former a tank commander. Uh, it's fascinating to, uh, having a chat to him and seeing his experiences of, you know, being in war zones for 22 years. He's he's no longer in the armed forces, but he was talking some very sort of dark things to say about Bosnia and how, you know, horrific that still obviously sits really heavily with him. Uh, and he, he was talking about how so much of the Ukrainian conflict uh, reminds him of, of the Bosnian conflict. So, yeah, fascinating evening. The talk of uh, sort of torture chambers and that they discovered and mass graves and whatnot. It's just, you know, history repeating itself to some degree uh, in Ukraine. Very sad. OK, uh, let's move on to our usual starting place, which is the Ukrainian figures for the Russian losses for the day before or the campaign out supply as ever. Uh, 460 liquidated personnel. I think, again, that I'm going to say exactly the same thing. This is indicative of this transitional phase between the Russian offensive and the Ukrainian counteroffensive. One tank, one APC, nine artillery systems. So a re really quiet day in some respects, as in that, that figure of liquidated personnel is down towards the lower end of the losses that we've seen over the last six months. Uh, one tank, one APC, very low. Nine artillery systems, still a useful number there. They are still appearing to concentrate uh, on they still appear to be concentrating on taking out artillery systems three anti-aircraft warfare systems is significant but it, you never know exactly what they are without the sort of video footage to go with that and i've not seen any video footage of any anti-aircraft warfare system so is that something like a book is it an s300 is it a uh, 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 Auto cannon, I don't know. One drone, 15 cruise missiles, that'd be from the even the, the night before that won't have been added to the previous day's tally. Uh six, because there wasn't cru any cruise missiles last night. Six uh vehicles and fuel tanks and one piece of special equipment. So fairly quiet day, uh, in line with what we've been seeing, broadly speaking. Now, John Kirby said something that has got everyone's knickers in a twist. Has been he basically got it a bit wrong, but lots of people are still reporting this. So, for example, Tendar here says National Security Council spokesman John Kirby, in reference to Bakhmut and the fighting since December alone, quote: "We estimate that Russia has suffered more than a hundred thousand casualties, including over twenty thousand KIA, nearly half of whom were Wagner soldiers. Those insane numbers corroborate what we saw." The last five months and then people are saying actually no it, it was clarified and he he got it wrong it wasn't because it looks like that claim is that there are a hundred thousand casualties in Bakhmut, including twenty thousand i mean it doesn't go into details there but elsewhere it, it appears that he was ref referencing or referring to Bakhmut alone uh, but then loads of people have been commenting since. So John Kirby caused a lot of confusion with his remarks today. To clarify, he did not say Russia had suffered 20,000 killed in Bakhmut since December, as was originally reported. He said uh, that uh, was the figure across all fronts, but half was Wagner and most of the Wagner were convicts in Bakhmut. So, but just since December, we estimate that Russia has suffered more than 100,000 casualties, including over 20,000 killed in action, nearly half of whom were Wagner soldiers, and majority of whom were Russian convicts that were thrown into combat in Bakhmut. So, or Tendai is actually not reporting that that was Bakhmut um, explicitly, or it actually he says in reference to Bakhmut there. So, there's, there's big confusion. In fact, it, in the end, the Washington Post, who is reporting on this as well, put out a correction. A previous version of this article included information from a Monday briefing that where National Security Council spokesman John Kirby said Russia suffered 100,000 casualties, including more than 20,000 killed in action in Bakhmut since December. NSC Deputy Spokesman Sean Savat said later Monday that those figure figures account for all of Russia's losses across Ukraine, not just in Bakhmut since December. Additionally, a previous version, uh, so, uh, so on and so forth, uh, Michael Kaufman said, I'll just add this wasn't Washington Post or any other journalist's mistake. Uh, Kirby confused the situation at the presser. So I just wanted to mention that because in case some of you have been uh, reading that or seeing those, those quotes and thinking, wow, Bakhmut's been really, which it, it still has been really expensive for Russian forces, 
but actually those figures refer to the entire front line. And it's still, those are really bad figures, right? Uh, 100,000 casualties since since this year began, right? So five months, 100,000, that's, that's pretty bad. Um, okay, there were reports uh, this morning of a single boom similar to a military explosion in Melitopol, but no information out about that yet. In fact, there's relatively little news about an awful lot of stuff today. So my uh, hits and losses section is quite sparse. The Russians have done their usual stuff. So there have been S-300 missile attacks against Kramatorsk, uh, shelling, massive shelling against Adivka. Uh, Kramatorsk is just behind Bakhmut. It's one of those uh, towns in that semicircle or that crescent of towns, uh, Kramatorsk, Druzkivka, uh, Slavyansk and so on. Uh, the Russians shelled Kurokove, that's behind Marienka, uh, three times, and the agricultural enterprise was damaged, etc., etc., etc. You know, Chesivyar, Siversk, all these sort of places hit. Nothing particularly unusual. Uh, just uh, reviewing TASS, the Russian news agency, sort of parroting the Russian MOD line, really, talking about how Russian forces wiped out Ukrainian artillery system and a mortar system, killing eight and, and wounding four, uh, so on and so forth. But I, I found this was quite interesting, you know, talking about how uh, D 11 D20 howitzers were eliminated in the past week compared to seven the week before. And while the number of self-propelled howitzers destroyed went up from four to seven, uh, two S1 uh, Grodzvik uh, ones, rather than any of the ones that have been provided by the West recently. But Talks here said the amount of vehicles destroyed grew, grew from 53 to 102, while the number of Ukrainian fighters and foreign mercenaries killed rose by almost a thousand to reach 4,000. So they were having claiming that last week they were claiming 3,000 Ukrainians died. So over seven days, what's that? It's going to be about 450 ish, 400 and something per day. And that's uh, dead because they talk about merc mercenaries killed. Fighters and foreign mercenaries killed. That's how they call the International Legion and whatnot. Uh, and that's risen to 4,000 casualties over the last week, which is, if we divide that by seven, that's going to be 500, between five and 600 uh, casualties, deaths. So interesting. So how does that track with what the Ukrainians are saying? Well, it's pretty much uh, their like for liking with, with the Ukrainian numbers there. Uh, is that trustworthy? Do we trust the Russian MOD? Mm, not really. And it's funny that I was looking at this just after I'd seen this. And it's just a, an example of how the Russian MOD lie. Uh, and so when I look at those figures, right, if I've got good evidence that they lie elsewhere, what's the, what's the chance that they're lying here? Probably pretty high. This is a geolocation investigation. On 16th of February 2023, the Russian MOD posted this video of rail operations offloading fuel and delivering it a few kilometers from the front. So this was a, a, a Russian video to suggest that, hey, you know, we're doing all this work just, just by the front line, and here's, here's us working at the front line in Ukraine. And the video goes through just, you know, some logistical operations. Now, someone's just really geekily done a full-on uh geolocation of that and shows that actually it's not just by the front line it's in belgorod and here's all the uh evidences in belgorod so the russian MOD basically lying in a video uh, it's not it's not the biggest piece of like uh, so what that it's it's not um it's not at the front line where they said it was it's back in russia okay it's not the biggest lie but it's just i think indicative of the russian MOD being inherently untrustworthy in the claims they make so then when you go back to okay their claims of deaths and this and that uh is is that realistic probably not are, are they are they are they lying to some extent almost certainly but you know there will be ukrainian losses of course i'm not saying that the ukrainian forces are magic and, that, and they aren't taking heavy losses or some losses i i, I don't know but all I'm saying is Russian uh, MOD claims are not particularly trustworthy. Um, okay, what the Russians are doing in Bakhmut is absolutely hammering it with uh, TOS-1A thermobaric multiple launch rocket systems. This looks pretty uh, horrific. These are nasty bits of munition, and they are dropping these quite wildly, widely on Bakhmut. They're basically doing a Marienka to Bakhmut. 
I've seen footage of people driving to Bakhmut and the smoke rising from Bakhmut and it just looks from a distance, it looks apocalyptic. Well, this is it close up. Just absolutely, yeah, pretty terrible footage there of thermobaric munitions striking uh, Bakhmut quite widely. Right, this is uh, not particularly newsworthy. A Russia, pro-Russian TV channel of some description in Yalta, which is in Crimea on the south coast of Crimea. So they're, they're asking... Are you guys afraid of the counteroffensive coming up? Expecting like Russian pro-Russian sentiments to to be uh, widespread here, and they ask these two young lads. I love the ah. So she asks for those uh, that are are um, are listening. Are you not afraid of the counteroffensive? And these two lads go. Uh, we're we're for Ukraine. We're for Ukraine, and they walk off. And she goes, ah, <laughs> ah. Turns out that not everyone in Crimea is pro-Russian. Uh, who knew? Uh, but it is uh, that's a pretty risky thing to do, though. Crimea is so overtly Russian in in its obviously in the the leadership going on there, the governance that is taking place there, uh, and any kind of any pro-Ukrainian uh, sentiments, it, it's dangerous to be public with that. And we heard the other day how they are planning on deporting people from the occupied regions who show any overt support for Ukraine, that kind of thing. So it, it's, it's it's a risk to, to do things like that. Um, okay. Um, I hope those, those kids are safe. Um, moving on to military aid and such like, uh, minister, a Ukrainian minister has said, Eight offensive guard brigades are fully formed and others are in progress. These are the 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 offensive guard are the people who are going to be sent in after Ukraine liberate Ukrainian areas during a counteroffensive. So you need people to run the administration to sort things out, to clear out uh, remnants of Russian troops that might be there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you don't want your main offensive brigades to be doing that to to the, to liberate a, a town and or a settlement or an area of fields or whatever it, once they've liberated that you don't want them to be the ones then clearing everything up and spending the next week sort of doing x y and z they need to be going on with m added momentum to the next place and to the next place and 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 doing the uh, the actual counter offensive so the offensive guards are these people that then follow on behind and do all that stuff that's going to take longer uh, and so you need an awful lot of troops to do that because as you take more and more territory or as you intend to take more and more territory, you hope that that you've got enough people to do that clearing up operation. And remember, there, there might well be collaborators. There might be people who there might be all these sort of booby traps, all the stuff that needs to be sorted out um, as as your actual counteroffensive, the main vanguard of your counteroffensive is moving on and further afield so these are it's a new initiative launched in february 2023 as i say here uh, by ukraine's national guard to train eight french fresh brigades made up of both experienced soldiers and fresh volunteers so it is everything is looking closer to was it h day or the day of the counter offenses properly starting um okay ukraine can receive additional ammunition for gepards already in august says schultz uh, he has also stated that Ukraine should not fire on Russian territory with German-supplied weapons. This comes after an earlier statement from Pistorius that limited attacks by Ukraine on Russian territory are an acceptable tactic in repelling Russia's invasion. I reported on that. Pistorius saying, hey, you know, we can we can sympathize with the Ukrainians wanting to take out Russian targets in Russia because... You know, that's what you're going to need to do if you're trying to repel Russians and get them off your territory. They're going to have supply lines. They're going to have depots in Russia. It's going to be acceptable to strike those. Schultz possibly walking that back, or not, not fully walking back, saying, yeah, you go, I assume what he's saying here, reading between the lines, is, yeah, you can do that. But yeah, try not to do that with German weapons because um, that's that, that won't look cool for us. Uh, but anyway... Gepard ammunition coming in August. That is quite a quick turnaround considering they've had to start uh, the, the um, manufacture of this ammunition themselves rather than previously it was the Swiss, I think, who were making them and that's why they were trying to 
influence the Swiss and persuade the Swiss to give their ammunition to Ukraine. Swiss turned that down, citing their neutrality. And so Rheinmetall, I think it is, stepped up and said, OK, we'll start producing that ourselves and that will be ready in August. British S-90, this is a from the 1990 self-propelled howitzer. This one's in use with the 117th Brigade of the Ukrainian Army. And uh, yeah, good to see them in Ukrainian lands, hopefully part of one of the self-propelled howitzer brigades for the counter-offensive. Now, new batch of Ukrainian first-person view drones. These are the racing drones where you get the camera pointing forward. They usually attach to these things like RP, RP7, RPG7 warheads uh, and fly them into mechanized pieces of kit there's just a bunch of these there's a lot of these coming now united 24 has been doing a lot of fundraising to get these together when you look at video footage like this you're thinking okay is this a competitive advantage over the russians do the russians have this number of fpv drones for example is this somewhere where ukraine are now going to have an advantage going forward Indeed, some Russian sources I reported yesterday, I think it was, saying that Ukraine have probably a three to six month advantage in drones, in FPV drones. I think they were talking specifically about that. And therefore, when you see footage like this, you think this is stuff that the Russians don't have. And if they can put this into, get these onto the front line as soon as possible, then this is an advantage the Ukrainians will be having. Yes, the Russians have the Lancet loitering uh, kamikaze drones, loitering munitions. The Ukrainians' answer to them are these F FPV drones. Um, obviously, they still need to make sure they're defending adequately against the Lancet drones because they are one heck of a nuisance. Not just, and I've talked previously about this, this is not just the international provision from governments of uh, mechanized equipment and ammunition and weapons of war. Volunteers have purchased a total of 155 armoured vehicles in the UK for Ukrainian defenders, says Robley, um, or reports Robley here. The vehicle most commonly mentioned by the media is the F-103 Spartan, uh, but there are also F-105 Sultans, F-104 Samaritans, F FV-432 Bulldogs and Stormers. Stormers are the air defence version of these. Uh, this is great, uh, great news. Good to see these and they'll get sort of done up and uh, and made ready in Ukraine, one presumes, uh, by people who know what they're doing over there. And they'll be used. It'll be interesting to see. I mean, there's quite a wide variety of different vehicles here. It'll be interested to see how these are used, whether any of these find their way actually to the front line, whether these are new enough and decent enough to be used on the front line, or whether they'll be used behind the front lines more, and then you get the, the more recent equipment shoved up to the front line. But some of these uh, would have been... You know, things like the Stormer are still used, I, I, I gather. Um, depends how how kitted out they are. But uh, yeah, it's great news. All, not all equipment comes from national governments. There's an awful lot of people uh, fundraising and, and getting these off arms dealers. I talked to you, I showed you that clip from Channel 4 News about some guy that has a farm up in Northamptonshire in the UK, and he was uh, an arms equipment enthusiast he wasn't an arms dealer he said i don't know how i've accidentally become an arms dealer as he like all the stuff that he'd been collecting he's now like selling off to ukraine um really interesting sanctions on the russian aviation industry are leading to an increasing number of malfunctions and emergency landings due to a lack of maintenance and technical support and an acute shortage of spare parts safety is said to be gradually deteriorating the russian newspaper novaya gazeta reports that sanctions have had drastic effects on russian airlines which overwhelmingly rely on western made aircraft boeing and airbus both cut off access and to technical support and the supply of spare parts was stopped some spare parts are still available through gray schemes such as wheels and brakes. However, industry insiders say that gr such great imports uh, are arriving much slower and cost more. Engine parts cannot be imported, forcing airlines to do costly maintenance work themselves. This affects Russian-made aircraft too, such as the Sukhoi Superjet 100 and the MS-21, which both mostly rely on foreign-made components. Fuel filters are reportedly unavailable, leading the airlines to simply wash them and wait for them to fail instead of replacing them. The Russian aviation industry is replying 
uh, is replying on spare. I think that means um, relying on spare parts coming from places such as UAE, China, Turkey, and Iran. However, these reportedly take three to four times longer to arrive and cost three to four times as much. The supply chain is being choked off as sanctions are tightened. According to Novaya Gazeta, spare parts uh, suppliers have begun requiring intermediary companies in friendly countries, Turkey, UAE, China, Kazakhstan, to indicate the final recipient of spare parts up to the tail number of the aircraft. A number of countries, Belarus, Armenia, Kazakhstan, are simply in the block with large supplies of aircraft parts and materials as violating sanctions. The Russian government compensated for these problems in the first year of the war with Ukraine by allocating uh, 172 billion rubles at 2.15 billion dollars from the federal budget of which 100 billion or 1.25 billion dollars was intended to subsidize domestic transportation however this has only put off an inevitable crunch which now seems to be arriving Novaya Gazeta reports that airlines are cannibalizing their aircraft for spare parts while the planes are still flying are suffering from decreasing reliability. As Navarro Gazeta comments, since the beginning of 2023, news feeds have increasingly received reports of malfunctions, depressurization, emergency landings of Western-made airliners from Russian operators Aeroflot, Rossiya, Pobeda, Azure, Uter, and others. The increased costs are also now likely to be passed on to passengers, with the Russian government mooting a 15 to 30% rise in the cost of domestic flights in Russia and this summer. Pretty important because you hear claims like yesterday there was a even a Ukrainian expert, government expert, saying that actually the Russian economy hasn't really been affected and they will keep going on for a good couple of years unchanged. But actually, what they present, what the Russians present, is is arguably very different to what's actually going on underneath underneath the bonnet. And here, the Russian air industry is a, a good reflection of that, where. It's yeah, they might still be flying planes, but it's kind of falling apart, um, arguably. So we'll we'll keep an eye on that, see how, how that develops. Uh, Russia, th this is good to see. Uh, Republican House Speaker uh, Kevin McCarthy actually not rising to a Russian question here, and showing his support for the government for the Biden administration's support for Ukraine. So this is brilliant. There is a bit of a caveat here in that he didn't quite hear the question and the, I think the important word uh, the question is unlimited uh, uh, aid military aid but anyway listen to this Vyacheslav Tartakovsky RIA Novosti Russia uh, we know that uh, you don't support uh, the current unlimited and uh, uncontrolled uh, supplies of weaponry and aid to Ukraine so can you come so what he answers here is he misses the unlimited an uncontrolled supply of weaponry, and he just takes it as a general point. And is it possible if in the near future uh, the U.S. policy regarding sending weaponry to Ukraine will change? Okay, I'm not sure. The, the, the sound here is not good. Did he say, I don't support aid to Ukraine? No, I vote for aid for Ukraine. I support aid for Ukraine. I do not support what your country has done you to, to Ukraine. I do not support your killing of the children either. And I think for one standpoint, you should pull out, and I don't think it's right. And we will continue to support because the rest of the world sees it just as it is. Brilliant. Great stuff from McCarthy there. Really good to hear that. You want bipartisan support in, in the US for this, and that's fantastic. Now, uh, shall I shall I run through this? This is pretty astonishing, right? As Tim White says, I may have a new hero. Leonid Yakov, uh, Yakovlevich Gozman is a liberal in Russia and a former co colleague of murdered Boris Nemtsov. That's a real shame. Boris Nemtsov was could have been could have been leader of Russia and yeah in the Union of Right Forces. He tells it like it is in Ukraine. Criminals running DPR and LPR. Nothing bad has happened under Ukraine rule in Slavyansk. So. Let's just quickly run through, and it's worth listening to this in the original because you could get a sense of how he feels from his voice and everything. But he is, he is really strong here. Why I believe that you, me, uh, me, Genia, yes, we are as citizens of this country. We bear responsibility for the nightmare taking place there in Ukraine right now. Um, that's what I believe. You and I bear the responsibility as a citizens of the Russian Federation. This is why I believe so. This horrible war with casualties on both sides, ugliness, violence, etc. It wouldn't have lasted more than a day if we didn't supply the so-called leaders of these republics with weapons, money and people. 
Do you understand? I don't have proof, but from my point of view, they're simply criminals. They are simply criminals, understand? One of the leaders of the DPR, Mr. Pushilin, uh, before he started fighting for free Donbass, was a regional manager for the MMM. Everybody remembers MMM. Yes, he was a regional manager of MMM, and now he's fighting for Donbass freedom, yes? Uh, I, I don't believe these people, he says. Uh, and then uh, she comes in, Leonid Yaklov, Yak. Kovlevich, this is such a simple situation. I'll interrupt you for a second. Uh, and Zakhar Zakarchenko, before the war, was selling chickens. He had two kiosks. Uh, do you understand that if, and he, he comes back in, do you understand that if we weren't supporting these people, the war there would have ended very soon? And it wouldn't have ended in genocide and such like. It's all BS. Uh, because there's an example. There's a town called Slovyansk that our criminal Gherkin was defending for a long time. The stroke of Gherkin, a citizen of the Russian Federation that hell knows why on the territory of another country, as you are imagining it, and sorry, the translation is a bit dodge, and as always, you don't have any proof. Excuse me, I have proof. He positioned himself as a commander of those defence forces. Um, he is a citizen of the Russian Federation. He was also a commentator working for the newspaper Zavtra. So Rogozin promised to go to Slovyansk, said he'll leave all his positions for the happiness to be in the trenches defending Slovyansk. He didn't make it for some reason. Uh, so after Gherkin was kicked out of Slovyansk and the Ukrainian army entered it, nothing abnormal happened. Normal life resumed and no humanitarian disaster is happening there. We have nothing to do there. Our guys have nothing to do there. And because we support these Zakarchenkos that are stealing gigantic money there, etc., you as a citizen of the Russian Federation and I as a citizen of the Ru Russian Federation bear responsibility. Uh, absolutely brilliant. I mean, it's a bit garbled from the translation there, but the idea is that, and I want to know whether this is recent or whether this was previous just after the 2014 attack, but the people who voiced the these... Uh, sorts of ideas like uh, the truth need to be need to be supported as much as possible i mean i can't imagine that someone like that isn't going to be uh, worried that they're going to be falling out of a window pretty soon uh, but again i'd like to know exactly when that was recorded um that's just sort of popped up now but it might be a, an older recording uh, and not pertaining to this exact war but but the previous 2014 iteration um, but those are the kind of people that that we in the West and supporting Ukraine would like to see uh, have more influence in the Russian media landscape because they are they have a better grip on reality than than the outright propagandists do. Right. From Euromaidan Press, update following an international backlash, drinks giant Perno Ricard uh, made a U-turn on resuming exports of jams from whiskey uh, and beefy to gin to Russia. The company has no timeline for exiting Russia yet, calling the process complex and extremely engaging. They need to get out of there soon, uh, and I think there needs to be a continued pressure on uh, com companies that are operating within Russia uh, to get out there it's very easy i think to to for this whole war to be normalized and for companies to go oh okay let's let's start working with russia again or let's not get out we're still in there everyone's got used to it and we're just going on as per usual then there, there needs to be a a consistent pressure on companies even now 430 40 days after the war started needs to be pressure on these companies to get out of, of Russia, to put that economic pressure on Russia themselves to stop this war. Um, very important, I think, UN resolution. I mean, it, it only has kind of a bit of a sideways reference to Ukraine. It's not a direct resolution on Ukraine. However, the language of this resolution, I'm going to talk about the language before I talk about the vote. Russia is mentioned in the following paragraph of the resolution, recognize, quote, recognizing also that the unprecedented challenges now facing Europe following the aggression by the Russian Federation against Ukraine and the and against Georgia prior to that and the cessation of the membership of the Russian Federation of the Council of Europe call for strengthened cooperation between the UN and the Council of Europe, notably in order to promptly restore and maintain peace and security based on respect of the sovereignty, territorial integrity, 
democracy and political independence of any state, ensure the observance of human rights and international humanitarian law during the hostilities, provide re uh, redress to victims and bring to justice all those responsible for the violations of international law. Okay, so that uh, it, this uh, resolution was about um, uh, cooperation between the UN and the Council of Europe. Uh, where aggression of Russia against Ukraine was mentioned. So that paragraph was in there. It wasn't directly about the war in Ukraine. However, that is pretty strong wording to, you know, you're talking about human rights violations, people being held accountable, et cetera, et cetera. And then the vote on this was 122 in favour, five against. The against were Russia, Syria, Nicaragua, uh, North Korea, Belarus. OK, what's really interesting? Yes, a bunch of abstentions. But look at some of these names that voted for China. China voted for Armenia. I mean, it's really interesting. Yes, South Africa and uh, I think uh, South Africa vote abstained, but Brazil voted for. This is this was huge. In fact, Igor Gherkin has come out and said this is a massive political loss for Russia. He was he was condemning of this uh, or he shared something that that that, sh that stated that. Um, so, yeah, this is a really important uh, political statement, I think, by some pretty big nations. China and Brazil, they're voting for that, I think, is very, very revealing. And finally, uh, Russian President Putin on Tuesday ordered his government to clarify the procedure for how Russian companies can make dividend payments to shareholders from so-called unfriendly countries. Russia considers all countries that have hit it with sanctions over its military campaign in Ukraine to be unfriendly. It has hit back with its own package of counter sanctions and capital controls, which restrict the ability of companies and investors from these countries to transfer profits or dividends back home. So taking money out of Russia and taking if they're making a profit in Russia, they you know Putin doesn't want that money to leave Russia. Reuters reports the Kremlin said proposals on dividend payments should include conditions that residents expand their production in Russia, develop businesses based on new technologies and invest in the Russian economy. Putin asked the government to come up with proposals by 20th of May, a, a document published by the Kremlin said. So this will be this is kind of pertains to a, what I've just mentioned in a few places, Pernod Ricard and, and companies and also the air industry. You know, sanctions will hurt and we need to put pressure on on companies to pull out of Russia because actually if they, even if they stay in there and do business and make money, there's every chance that Russia could help themselves to the profits that they make. And uh, it's probably not really worth them them staying there. I'd hope that's the case. And I hope we see a renewed uh, removal of, you know, Western corporations from, from uh, Russia, if not removal, you know, getting out there themselves, not being removed, but just voluntarily saying, hey, this is not morally worth it. It's not morally right. It's not economically worth it. Anyway, that's uh, me uh, done for today for the news. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Please like, subscribe and share. Sorry, my brain isn't working too well. A couple too many beers last night. Uh, note to self, don't do that in future. Just stay at home every night, always and forever. Uh, anyway, uh, take care. I'll speak to you soon.